So we'll continue from the slide where we left in the last class, that is uh, triacylglycerol. So I was explaining about the adipose um, tissue and the adipose sites. So these are four adipose sites filled with fat, and then I showed you this is a um, cartilidin of a seedling. You know, these are the seed leaves. As soon as the plant uh, seed germinates, the two thick leaf-like structures basically the seed that opens into two parts um so these white area are the lipid storage in them so we need to learn three major um, points uh, with respect to free fatty acids as well as uh, the ester form with glycerol that is the triacyl glycerol so, so they are uh, shown here in uh, listed in bullet form the first one is unsaturation and melting point so this is something we have uh, yesterday considered that is the when you have double bond in the aliphatic chain so that is what we call as unsaturation so the degree of unsaturation reflects how many double bonds are there and that has a direct bearing on melting point uh, as i uh, told you in the previous class um the double bond prevents a uh, free rotation of uh, between the two carbons that have the double bond and as a result uh, there is a fixed orientation of the chains on both sides of the double bond and that uh, interferes with compact packing and as a result uh, fats having more double bonds in the side chain they usually are liquid at room temperature so that is why uh, vegetable oils which have a lot of um, poly, mono and polyunsaturated fatty acids they are liquid at room temperature on the other hand uh, butter which has um, mostly saturated fats uh, is solid at room temperature okay so in this um, context uh, we need to consider one more point which is um, this degree of unsaturation also leads to uh, lipid degradation and a process that we call as rancidity you may have noticed if you have stored oil particularly at room temperature not tightly capped for a long time it starts to develop a foul smell so that uh, then you say this oil has gone bad and then you throw away and that smell the one that you call as oil has gone bad is uh, technically known as the rancidity this is primarily because what actually happens um, in these uh, unsaturated fats uh, is um, you know like if you have double bond let us say so here you have carbon on either side so this double bond oftentimes becomes um, okay I'll draw here it gets oxidized okay So these are called this structure of more one oxygen uh, added between these two carbons. This we call as lipid peroxidation. Okay, lipid peroxidation. This again breaks down into aldehydes and uh, carboxylic acid and so on. This breaking down into shorter portions due to oxidation, this peroxidation is what causes the um, property called the rancidity and this has a major consequence if it is um, the lipid chain of uh, cell membrane so then the cell membranes integrity is lost so therefore this is not something that is good for the integrity of cell membrane so to prevent this we have antioxidants in the lipid uh, phase as well hydrophobic antioxidants we will learn about them a little later so this free radical generation that happens uh, free radicals are produced in other reactions can cause this peroxidation 
and this peroxidation can lead to breakdown of the membrane lipid as well as the breakdown products are reactive again so this is for example it is easy for you to understand how this will break into an aldehyde and so to prevent all of that you have antioxidants in the lipid phase as well so that is rancidity and the second uh, important point we need to consider here again is the, all this results from the double bond okay the uh, unsaturation one the melting point goes down then i told you about rancidity then the third is the uh, possibility of trans fat so this double bond here uh, is a site for or uh, cis and trans you know geometrical isomerism so for example if the groups attached here so you could have that same group attached in trans orientation or on the other hand you could have um, both of them on the same orientation let us, let us say two hydrogens attached and they could be on the same orientation or on the other orientation so this would be cis so this cis trans possibility arises due to this double bond and the um, prevention of rotation uh, around the rotation of these groups around this bond and due to that you have this isomer isomers possible and naturally occurring uh, unsaturated fats are more or all cis isomers so that is what is normally found in our body and this trans isomers are usually not hydrolyzed and metabolized in our body and they usually lead to build up of uh, fat deposition in our blood vessels leading to uh, you know high blood pressure and leading to atherosclerosis and other heart diseases okay atherosclerosis results from reduction in the uh, luminal phase of the blood, blood vessels and therefore the blood flow is obstructed increasing the pressure required to push the blood and therefore the heart overworks and they eventually you have heart problem and trans fats usually are a cause of this so therefore trans fats are not good for health and where do we get the trans fats normally from there are two sources of trans fats one um cattle you know but like cow sort of animals uh, their uh, digestive system harbor bacteria that produce trans fats okay so therefore meat products as well as dairy products have trans fat that is one source so therefore they are not you, you should not have too much of them it's it's bad for health and uh, second source is uh, people make saturated fat out of vegetable oils for example you try to reduce this um, double bond and therefore it is saturated uh, fat and that is called a hydrogenation okay so vegetable oils usually are hydrogenated to produce artificial butter you would have heard in the commercial name dalda or vanaspati so they are uh, vegetable oils artificially saturated the double bonds are reduced chemically in the factory and you get saturated fat so these uh, have a historical reason at one point getting enough butter wasn't easy and butter was expensive therefore people wanted to make uh, hydrogenated vegetable oil as a substitute for making sweets and other uh, baked goods like bread uh, cookies and biscuits and so on but in the process people realized um, they are more stable than uh, natural saturated fat and um, vegetable oils which are unsaturated fat and therefore the bakery items made using trans fats were stable for longer they could be stored longer without having the problem of rancidity.
that is one second people liked the texture you know they are crispier if you have uh, cookies made using um, trans fat like uh, vanaspati or dalda they are more uh, they are crispier and people uh, like the texture for example if you go to a place like delhi on the road side when where you have a famous uh, samosa guy he makes that samosa really crispy and tasty and nice and that's because he generously uses dalda in the uh, oil in which he uh, fries the samosa and when you eat that you get a lot of trans fat and the trans fat is really deadly for health you know as you get past middle east sorry middle age um you often run into high blood pressure and obesity and atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease all of that so the the trans fat is a major cause so the fda recommendation or is i'm not sure about what who says uh, fda recommendation that is food and drug administration of us their recommendation is that totally avoid trans fats okay so you need to look at the wrapper or uh, when you buy biscuits or cookie next time look at the wrapper whether it says trans fat zero if it says trans fat zero it is good but it is not going to be very crispy the the biscuit might become quickly uh, you know powdery but it is okay okay it's it's lot better for health similarly when you buy bread you know read the label make sure that it is trans fat zero uh if you go to a local bakery you know a regular non branded local bakery so they make everything using hydrogenated vegetable oil because that's what makes their products smell good feel good taste good store long all of that so so remember trans fat so this trans fat rancidity melting point all of them are directly due to the double bonds in the side chain of the acyl moiety in the triacyl glycerols okay so having covered these two topics uh, we'll move on now okay so another interesting uh, story about triacyl glycerol and this degree of unsaturation so yesterday i mentioned the difference between beef fat okay the, the um, i don't know how many of you have eat and beef or seen beef being cooked you will find like i have seen a uh, uh, patty that goes in making burger being grilled and then you will see lot of fat really melts and drips down and that has a longer chain fatty acid that is 18 carbon and 20 carbon sorry 18 carbon only it's 18 carbon stearic acid while butter has 16 carbon but both are saturated so longer the chain um higher the saturation then more solid that fat is so as a result beef fat is hard solid while butter is a soft solid so the difference here is only the length of the chain both are fully saturated otherwise so the point i want to make here is the length of the chain the degree of unsaturation both are important a mixture of them like you have varying lengths varying degrees of unsaturation all of that can give you uh, a a mixture such that the melting point can vary a lot okay and as a result whether it is going to be denser or it is going to be less dense all of that is determined by these two uh, factors that is length of the chain and the degree of unsaturation so shown here is a uh, sperm whale okay pay attention to its uh, head okay so this is its mouth um, so here is the eye and this is the portion a tank literally above the head you know its head is done here but this portion is a tank holds about 4000 liters of triacyl glycerol okay so remember the number 4000 liters
4,000 liters of triazyl glycer are here. So, why is this whale storing so much uh, fat there? That is primarily because its triazyl glycer oil has a happy mixture of the length and degree of unsaturation such that when it dives deeper uh, from the surface, you know, the surface is going to be warmer, the temperature is going to be, you know, warm, it's, it's a surface, or, or the air-water interface, it is going to be warmer, and due to that, this fat will be liquid, okay? So, its density will be lower and it can neatly uh, float uh, on the surface. But when it dives deep, it dives as deep as 3,000 meters, mostly about 1,000 meters. Even that is a lot deeper, like one kilometer from the surface of the ocean. And at that depth, you have schools of squid. And squid is what uh, this, uh, you know, uh, whale loves to eat because at that depth, it has no competition. And uh, as a result, um, it dives and then uh, just keeps quiet, wait for a school of squids to come by and then uh, it eats them. It feeds on the squids which are found at that depth. So when it dives that deep, the water is denser there and it wants to wait there longer. So its buoyancy should be adjusted to the surrounding dense uh, water. And the way it does that is, this uh, becomes a gel. The triazyl glycerol cools down because the temperature is cold. So it cools and becomes a jelly solid mixture whose density matches the uh, density of the surrounding ocean water. And therefore, it doesn't need to really spend a lot of energy to stay at that place floating. Okay. And when it dives back to the surface, then it becomes liquid and it um, ag again its density goes down and it is okay in surface. So by exploiting this uh, melting point difference that exists in the acyl moiety of the triazyl glycerols, this uh, whale has developed an adaptation that allows it to stay uh, float effortlessly at great depths. Okay. So this is one of the interesting story about triacyl glycerol. Okay, so next we'll let us move on to the next um, uh, lipid class, which is waxes. So waxes, as I told you at the introductory class, so these are long chain free fatty acids in ester linkage with long chain fatty alcohols. These are CH3, CH2, CH2, like, you know, long chain with an alcohol group and with that you have a free fatty acid like palmitic acid you know 16 carbon and uh, hexadecanoic acid you know if you want to follow the systematic name so that sort of an ester two long aliphatic chains one has carboxylic group another one has the alcohol group and the ester is is nothing but a wax so you can see the usefulness of wax here in this uh, image here the honeybee nest this honeycomb structure it is made of wax so this is mainly uh, it is an energy storage like other uh, lipids uh, its primary function is actually water repellent so you would have seen many shiny leaves and the shininess of the leaves is due to uh, a layer of waxes uh, some of the micro photosynthetic uh, ocean organisms called plankton, they store uh, much of their fuel in the form of waxes, okay? So that's uh, about a wax. And the waxes are important. Uh, so waxes are there even in sperm whale as well. And these are useful in cosmetic industry for um, preparing fragrances, uh, of many different varieties and for them these waxes are important and due to that so some of these organisms that produce these kind of fats they are hunted down nearly to extinction 
For example, the sperm whale, a single whale gives you uh, 4,000 liters of um, uh, fat and therefore people hunted these for getting lamp oil. You know, before um, fossil fuel, the petroleum was discovered, people were relying on these um, oils to light lamps, uh, particularly in the Western world. So uh, due to that, these whales are now in endangered species. You know, only very few exist now. And the uh, next class is a major one, which is the phospholipids, okay, membrane lipids. We already know about these phospholipids are the head group, which is the glycerol, where you can have hydrophilic moieties. And two of the alcohol groups in glycerol can have um, acyl moieties with the free fatty acids. And that's how you get the um, this structure, you know. So this is the glycerol head group and these are the two acyl moieties that we draw. So essentially it is this structure. Okay, so here you have an acyl group. Let me put as R2 and this is R1. So, so here you can have a polar group, like for example, you can have a phosphate uh, group. The other one I'm not writing, this is going about the board. So this portion can have other hydrophilic groups attached and that is what is this, the head group. And these two chains here, this is what your long chain here. Okay, so these are the phospholipids. And the phospholipids are of two types. So one is glycerophospholipid and the other one is a sphingophospholipid. So we we'll look at both of this now. So, so this triacyl glycerol you are already familiar with, the storage lipid. Now we are looking at the membrane lipid because they are polar. And one major group among them is the phospholipids. And phospholipids, there are two types. Glycerophospholipid, the structure that I just drew is glycerophospholipid. And there is one more called sphingolipid that also can have phosphate group. Okay, so we will revisit the glyco glycolipids later. So let us first deal with the phospholipid and understand their structure and then come back to glycolipids. So the phospholipids, the first one is the glycerophospholipid. So here you have the glycerol, CH2OH, CHOH, and then CH2OH. This is in ester bond with mineral acid, phosphoric acid. So here you have two groups available for further, um, you know, attachment to other groups. And this is the glycerol 3-phosphate. So this is the third carbon, so it is glycerol 3-phosphate, okay? So these two can have ester linkage with the uh, fatty acids. See here one shown with um, double bond. And this uh, phosphate group can be further derivatized with polar groups and that is what is the head substituent. This basic one where it is just the phosphoric acid is called phosphatidic acid. Okay, so written here, phosphatidic acid. So phosphatidic acid is the simply diacyl glycerol where the phosphate group is just the phosphate it did nothing no other group is added oh oh and it can have derivatives for phosphatidic acid it's simply that hydrogen there then you can have an ethanol amine there or you can have a phosphatidyl choline so this is very important in bile salts uh, which is required for emulsifying fat in our food for digestion in the small intestine okay so these are uh, part of the bile so for now you need not worry about it that we will think when we go to fatty acid uh, metabolism 
So like this, there are variety of groups. I'm not going to read out each one of them. So you get the idea. So this uh, group can have variety of polar substitutions. And that forms the head group. And these are the two tails. So that is how you have uh, lipid bilayer. So you have two leaflets there. So you have head group on one side and then head group on the other side. So just to make sure nobody has confusion, I'll draw this again. So you have that. So the two acyl groups and the head group where in phosphatidic acid, it is simply the phosphate and it could be derivatized. So you have one leaflet. Uh, like this and then you will have one more leaflet as well so therefore these hydrophobic groups face each other and therefore they have hydrophobic interactions and these polar groups face this could be the extracellular um, matrix outside of the cell and this could be cytoplasm Okay, cytosol. So both side it is aqueous environment and here is the hydrophobic. So this is how the phospholipids form the cell membrane. Okay, so the next one, so these are glycerol derivative phospholipids, therefore we call glycerophospholipids. So the next one is sphingolipid, where instead of glycerol, it is the sphingosin. Okay, this pink color shaded one. So sphingosin is the uh, basic unit. So sphingosin as drawn here resembles its first three carbons resemble glycerol's three carbons. But its side chain here, so it is a long um, amino alcohol. So it has OH groups and then an amino group. So it's a long chain amino alcohol having one double bond. And in the second carbon, you have the amino group where you can have an acyl moiety there. And then this alcohol group can be derivatized with the polar groups just like the glycerophospholipids. Okay. And when you have a phosphate group here, and that becomes the basic sphingophospholipid, and its name is ceramide, uh, shown here. Ceramide. Okay. And to that, if you have um, phosphocholine attached, then it is sphingomyelin. This is what uh, covers the long axons of our neurons and insulates them electrically. And uh, you know, um, it insulates against heat as well. So primary insulation there is electric. Okay, so that, that is what is the sphingomyelin. It is present in the myelin sheath, and that way that's why we call spire myelin. The sphingo itself has an interesting history to it because the person who discovered this molecule could not understand what it actually does and what is its important function. So therefore, he thought it is mystery like sphinx in uh, Egyptian. Civil and Egyptian civilization, and therefore he called them sphingolipids. Okay, they are mysterious like sphinx. And um, so that is sphingomyelin, and then you can have one glucose alone. Okay, so ceramide is just this OH group. Um, and when you have instead a phosphocholine, it is sphingomyelin. And if you have only one glucose attached to that OH group, like a glycosidic linkage, then that is a cerebroside. Instead of glucose, if you have lactose, like galactose glucose, then it becomes a globoside. And when you have multiple sugars, oligosaccharides, then you have a ganglioside. And there are varieties of ganglioides. Okay. So again, uh, I'm not going to bother you with all the individual names of these substituents, but you need to have this main idea. Sphingolipids 
or have spingos in base and then their amino group and have a long fatty acid chain attached and therefore it will be the hydrophobic part hydrophobic tail and then one of the alcohol groups can be derivatized okay so without any derivative it is ceramide then you have various derivatives so now an important aspect of uh, spingolipids is shown in this slide that is our blood groups okay so given that this will be the tail in the membrane and this will be on the surface you know the head group this is polar so here if you have this sequence this particular um oligosaccharide glucose galactose n acetyl galactose and galactose and fucose then that is recognized okay you remember these are address tags sugar code we learned yesterday and this structure when it is present on the cell surface that is o antigen in our blood cells okay and you attach one n acetyl galactose sum into this galactose your a group so antibodies specifically bind to this that do not bind recognize this and instead of n acetyl galactose i mean you have just galactose that is b antigen so this is the basis for the the biochemical basis of a b o blood group so if you have an ab blood group then you your cell surface rbc surface has both these uh, sphingolipids so sphingolipids are the antigens a b and o so they are important for biological recognition so the next group so we are done with the phospholipids um so i, I think we kind of yes we glossed over or we ignored this particular group i'll spend one minute on this so you can have uh, instead of these phospho groups in the glycerophospholipid you can have sugar moiety directly added to this alcohol group of glycerol and when you have them they become the galactolipids and usually remember we have learned oligo uh, the carbohydrates monosaccharides can have uh or acid groups like carboxyl group sulfate group attached and usually they are sulfated mono and disaccharides and that's galactolipid then you have um this sphingolipid instead of the phosphate group you could have an oligosaccharide attached and they are the sphingoglycolipids so so this is phospholipid group where the phosphate becomes part of it and here oligosaccharide is the one that is hydrophilic group and therefore these are glycolipids so you have two types of membrane lipids one is the phospholipid and another one is the glycolipid so do not worry about this this is uh, too much for an introductory group so introductory, introductory biochemistry class i'm going to ignore this archibacterial specific lipids because I am sure already you are going to complain that we are learning a lot of uh, molecular structure. So the next is something that we cannot ignore like the way we ignore the archibacterial uh, specific uh, lipids. Uh, sterols are very important. Okay, Cholesterol is one of the main components of the, our biomembranes. It, it is important to determine the fluidity in addition to the uh, unsaturation in the fatty acid moiety of the phospholipids. Um, presence of cholesterol in the membrane is also important for membrane's unique uh, dynamics. And the cholesterol is an example, a, a main uh, example of a class of lipids called sterols. And the basic structure of sterol uh, is the presence of these four rings. This is cyclopentano phenanthrene ring. So, this three benzene ring attached in this fashion is what we call as the phenanthrene. And this is cyclopentano phenanthrene. And to that, you might have a side long alkyl side chain as seen in cholesterol, and some may not have this. 
and these groups will vary from sterol to sterol this is the specific structure of cholesterol so you have a polar head already and oh this is a polar group and you can have more polar moieties attached via this um, hydroxyl group here and uh, cholesterol is also an important storage uh, fatty acid sorry uh, storage uh, sterol and it is also the precursor for the formation of many steroid hormones that we will see in the next slide and the cholesterol is also uh, added to a peptide um, like um, signaling molecule which we will you which you probably learn in uh, cell signaling as part of cell biology class or much later if you take uh, developmental biology elective and there i will talk about um, cholesterol modified signaling molecule that is critical for um, many developmental processes so now let us look at the steroid hormones okay before that there is one important side note that we need to learn so uh, these oligosaccharides that you find in phospholipids and sphingolipids so, so here this picture is showing um, primarily sphingolipids or only sphingolipid here yeah it's all sphingolipids uh, ceramide in one side and then here you have the globocide um, sphingomyelin so so here the breakdown of specific polysaccharides, uh, specific uh, carbohydrate sugar moiety from this long chain is catalyzed by specific enzymes. For example, uh, from this ganglioside, remember ceramide with the oligosaccharide is what we learned as ganglioside. Uh, you have a beta galactosidase enzyme that removes this particular sugar. Okay and if this enzyme is not present suppose someone has a genetic mutation and as a result they do not produce this enzyme then they cannot hydrolyze this and that leads to a disease called a generalized ganglio gangliosidosis okay and similarly another pathway where you have problem the next step actually you have Tay-Sachs disease and so on at each step if that particular enzyme is mutated you have a particular disease uh, because of the failure to metabolize uh, these molecules and um, if if someone in a family is known to have this disease then you can uh, diagnose in the offspring by taking uh, amniotic fluid you know the fluid that uh, cushions the developing embryo and uh, look for whether that mutation is there or not in that amniotic fluid they can the cells present there one can culture and uh, find out whether that mutation is there then accordingly you can counsel them a process called the genetic counseling okay um so there are main, the main point here is there are many inborn errors in metabolism meaning genetic mutation so it is there um, you know in birth itself and they cause problems in lipid metabolism leading to human diseases so these are in general called inborn errors in metabolism meaning they are already there when you are born and these are errors in metabolism metabolism they fails in this process and since this is based on DNA sequence, it can be diagnosed and genetic counseling can be used to counsel the people about um, going ahead with the given pregnancy or marrying that person is the right thing or not given your genetic uh, constellation and so on. So, so this is kind of stage, uh, setting the stage for our next transition of lipid functions which is uh, lipids function as signals okay they are not simply compact storage of energy or compartmentalization as we see in cell membrane they can act as signaling molecules and they can be cofactors in enzyme catalyzed reactions and they are pigments as well which are very important 
So we'll go ahead and look at them, you know, what they do in each one of these authors. First, we are going to look at a signaling molecule. Okay, phosphatidyl ionositol. We know phosphatidic acid, right? Glycerol having two acyl groups, and the third alcohol group has phosphate, and that is phosphatidic acid. If that phosphate has this sugar alcohol ionositol, okay, so it is uh, again, so ionositol is. Um, So it is like glucose um, structure, it's just that it has OH everywhere. I'm ignoring the hydrogen in the interest of time. Uh, and then an OH here and then an OH here. So this is inositol. It's a sugar alcohol. You don't have CH2OH here, um, then otherwise it's um, like uh, any other hexose. And when that is attached to phosphatidic acid, that is phosphatidyl ionositol. And this is a membrane lipid. And this could be further phosphorylated, um, leading to what is called phosphatidyl ionositol 4,5 bisphosphate okay so you need to understand the difference in biochemistry between biphosphate bisphosphate trisphosphate as written here versus triphosphate okay so here for example uh 145 triphosphate means this particular hydroxyl group was in ester linkage with the phosphate of the glycerol okay and in addition, you have in the fourth position a phosphate attached and a fifth position a phosphate attached. So three different alcohol groups having the phosphate that is trisphosphate. If you have two of them, it is, it is bisphosphate. Instead, you have a phosphate attached to one of them and to that phosphate, you have another phosphate and another phosphate as you see in ATP that is triphosphate okay three phosphates attached in tandem to one alcohol group so that is triphosphate so this is how tri and tris differentiate the different structures tris means three different alcohols having monophosphates tri means one alcohol group having three phosphates so this inositol 4 by bisphosphate um, uh, you know, which is made on the membrane, the membrane phosphorylated inositol, the inositol moiety can be phosphorylated twice by transferring from ATP. So this will be ATP phosphorylated inositol phosphotransferase. That will be the name based on whatever we learned about naming enzymes. Remember the enzyme commission's four digit names. And this molecule produced uh, in response to extracellular signals that bind to specific receptors on the membrane can be hydrolyzed to produce um, so once in the phosphatidic uh, acid if you remove the phosphate out then it is simply diacylglycerol so that is going to be part of the membrane because of the acyl groups while this inositol that is hydrolyzed the phosphatidic acid phosphate now remains with the first carbon of inositol. So you produce inositol 145 trisphosphate. Or very affectionately, signaling people call it as um, IP3. Okay. So, so this IP3 is the major intracellular signaling molecule. So this is produced by extracellular signals that interact with the uh, membrane bound receptors leading to inositol phosphorylation and hydrolysis to release the inositol trisphosphate. This moves within the cytoplasm and releases stored 
calcium from, for example, the endoplasmic reticulum. And the calcium release uh, in conjunction with the diacylglycerol activates protein kinase C, which is an enzyme that phosphorylates proteins. Remember, covalent modification of proteins can activate or inactivate them. We saw the phosphorylase being activated by uh, phosphorylation and that phosphorylated phosphorylase being inactivated by removing the phosphate group. So, by phosphorylating downstream target proteins, this protein kinase C modulates activity within the cell. So, that is how the intra extracellular signal is transduced by the production of intracellular signaling molecule IP3. So, this is one way by which lipids act as signaling molecules. And, uh, yeah. So, next is a major class of um, signaling molecules, prostaglandins, thromboxanes and leukotrienes. The discovery of prostaglandins was considered so significant that the discoverers won Nobel Prize for having discovered prostaglandins. So, these were first found isolated from prostate gland and that is why the name prostaglandin. But they are produced by other tissues as well. So, okay, now let us uh, get to them from what is familiar to us. So, we already know this structure, diacylglycerol group and with this polar head group, okay. So, I glossed over or I didn't even talk about these uh, enzymes called lipases. They are named based on which bond here, you know, do they cleave here, cleave here, cleave here, cleave here. They have their names A1, A2, B, C and so on. So, you don't need to worry about it. In this particular example, here you have the fatty acyl chain with the four double bonds and this is arachidonic acid, okay, 20 carbon fatty acid with the four uh, unsaturated bonds and this is released from the membrane uh, in response to signals and this shown in a uh, hairpin shape here for convenience of moving to the next step. This is the free arachidonic acid. It's a carboxylic acid with the four double bonds. And there is an enzyme called cyclooxygenase or affectionately COX, COX. Okay. Um, COX. So, it's basically cyclooxygenase because it cyclizes the structure, this linear structure by this bond formation here uh, becomes a cyclical structure and that is a prostaglandin. There are many derivatives that is what is indicated by E1 here, so I am not going to get into those details, not necessary here. And this is how you uh, produce uh, biosynthesis of prostaglandin takes place. And a different modification, you are thromboxan. And then another one, leukotriene. So this is not cyclical, okay. So here you have this peroxide kind of structure here. So these are three molecules produced from this 20 carbon fatty acid. That's the name. That's where the name comes from, eco-sanoids, eco standing for 20 carbon, okay. Deco means uh, 10 and eco is 20. So, these three together are called eco -sanoids. Now, let us look at individually each one of these three, what they actually do and probably we'll stop there today. So, prostaglandins, they regulate the synthesis of cyclic AMP. So, this is an internal um, phosphate linkage between two hydroxyl groups, two alcohol groups of the ribose, a single phosphate. Remember, the phosphate has H3PO4, you have three acid groups there. So, it can actually make three ester bonds and uh, cyclic AMP has only two ester bonds um, between the third carbon and the second carbon of the ribose and that's what is adenosine monophosphate, uh, cyclic adenosine monophosphate. So, this is an important second messenger intracellular like IP3. Um, I introduced a 
word here second messenger right so i'll explain that you, you are already kind of familiar in the context of ip3 the extra cellular signal coming from somewhere else and binding to the cell surface receptor is the primary messenger okay so you can call that as first messenger in response to that internally in the cytoplasm you produce molecules like cyclic amp or ip3 and they are the second messengers because they are still messengers they have to go and tell someone to do an activity like for a protein kinase that needs to modify something to change their activity so that is where this idea of second messenger comes from so the cyclic amp is an important second messenger regulating variety of processes therefore prostaglandins regulating the synthesis of cyclic amp has influence on regulating many processes one a primary one being smooth muscle contraction okay so this smooth muscle contraction is the primary reason uh, you have menstrual cramps okay so the prostaglandins are the hormones that stimulate the smooth muscle to push out the you know the follicle out and similarly during uh, childbirth the very same thing the prostaglandins induce the smooth muscle contraction to push the fetus out and prostaglandins therefore play a very important role and they they regulate blood flow to specific organs again that comes from smooth muscle contraction okay blood vessels are smooth muscle and whether you are going to dilate it or constrict it is determining the blood flow and that's directly controlled by prostaglandins in addition to this role on smooth muscle contraction they are also important for wake sleep cycle uh, responsiveness of tissues to other hormones such as epinephrine glucagon you're not going to learn about them so don't even worry about it so they are hormones regulating processes in the body and body temperature elevation when you have inflammation and pain so if you have an inflammation and pain due to some infection uh, and you want to control that you block prostaglandin so temporarily you really you are relieved from the pain and inflammation and that's exactly what happens when you block the cox enzyme here so you see this red um, cross circle here so this is an inhibitor remember enzyme inhibitors we have learned the most famous enzyme inhibitor is aspirin you know acetyl salicylic acid the most common painkiller that people take and aspirin blocks this cox and as a result prostaglandin production is reduced and due to that inflammation and pain is temporarily relieved okay and these are non steroid anti inflammatory drug and that's why they are called nsaid what it indicates that there are steroid class of anti inflammatory as well so we will learn about them later but for now the focus is nsaid which is aspirin the main example is aspirin which blocks this enzyme as a result you don't make prostaglandin and as a result you don't have pain and inflammation and it controls fever as well so the next one is thromboxane this is produced by platelets these are like fragments of cells present in our blood and they are important for blood clotting and that is um, in, induced by thromboxanes and the, the so this i talked about nsaid already so the third one is the leukotrienes okay so leukotrienes are um, involved in uh, contraction of muscle linings of the airways of the lung so as a result too much leukotriene uh, leukotriene means constriction of airways and therefore you don't breathe well and that is the cause for asthma so some allergens like pollens can stimulate over production of leukotriene and the over production of leukotriene leads to contraction of the airway muscles the muscles that uh, help in breathing they are pushed to the contracted mode and as a result you are unable to breathe well and that is what is asthmatic attack so the, the anti inflammatory drugs uh, focus on preventing production of these signaling molecules and therefore these issues do not happen
okay so these eicosanoids they all work in nearby cells from where they are produced okay and as a result they are called paracrine uh, signals okay paracrine the molecules that travel long distance like insulin or epinephrine glucagon written in the previous slide they travel from one organ to other organs at distance via blood stream and they are called endocrine so we will learn um probably a little bit about insulin later and otherwise we are not learning endocrinology as part of biochemistry so the paracrine molecules work nearby the area where they are produced so the these eicosanoids are paracrine signals so with this i'll stop here today then tomorrow we will continue to um cofactors um you know how lipids function as cofactors and how lipid derived pigments are important in metabolism so those aspects we will cover in on monday